Welcome to Tourum TV, Episode 7. In this episode, we're back in the sunshine of Miami for Miami Music Week. Cedric Gervais spends a day with Tourum TV and shows us around some of his favourite spots in the city. We then head to the behemoth that is the Ultra Music Festival. This now huge festival is in its 15th year and is spread over two weekends for the first time. Tourum Records has its very own stage in association with UMF Radio. Then for something a little bit different, we drop in on a charity basketball match, which sees a slew of DJs and producers going head to head on the court. We also have a quick roundup of some of the key clubs and parties that make Miami Music Week an event on your clubbing calendar that you simply do not want to miss. Then we head back to Berlin, putting the spotlight on German talent and get the lowdown with Tosilo from Pampot. He sits down and tells Tourroom TV what it's like being part of the duo. Next stop, Fritz Kalkbrenner drops in to tell us about his album Sick Travelling, including its global tour. And finally, we bring you a dining experience with a difference. Pretadina fuses high-class food with high-quality culture. Tourroom TV speaks with some of the team to fill you in on this curious event that was born in Berlin and now takes on the world. Another full-on show, so get comfortable and get ready for Tourroom TV Episode 7. So first we join Miami local Cedric Gervais as he takes us on a quick tour of his hometown. We check out somewhere to eat, somewhere to keep fit and of course somewhere to party. Tourum TV rides shotgun with Cedric as he reminisces on coming to live in Miami back in the day. What's up guys, this is Cedric Gervais. Um, welcome to Miami. This is uh, Miami Music Week. We're now driving on Collins Avenue and we're gonna go to uh, my favorite spot to eat some sushi right now. So. Well, I moved to Miami from Marseille uh, uh, at a young age, at 15. Um, basically, I started a residency in Paris at the Queen uh, when I was 15. And two months after my residency in Paris, they, you know, they all shut the clubs down. Uh, the government shut the clubs down. So a friend of mine at the time was living in Miami and asked me, told me, just move to Miami for a while. And then when everything settled down, you know, you go back to Paris and keep your residency. And I just moved to Miami, fell in love with the city and ever moved back to France. I've been here for 17 years now, so. So Cedric has been a Miami resident for quite a while and knows all the hottest spots in the city. We head to one of his favorite spots to eat, Planet Sushi. So we're here at my, uh, one of my favorite restaurants in Miami. It's a sushi place. Um, it's actually uh, all over Europe. There's one in Ibiza, one in Paris. It's called Planet Sushi. And uh, a friend of mine owns it, so best sushi in Miami. If you're ever in Miami, you have to try it out. Well, Miami is such a big, you know, it's a big scene for, you know, for everybody who come here, like Miami Music Week. Long time ago, uh, a guy called Bill Ketty started WMC, and uh, that's when it started all, you know, and uh, it started really small in Miami. There was like all the label doing the parties and everything, but he grew into, over the years, such a big thing. Now, now it's an attraction all over the world. People are flying here just, you know, see shows and, and it, it used to be more like about meetings and record labels and you know gathering and, and doing business and now it turned into like more like a festival like it's like every club there's DJ performings everywhere there's like the ultra grew massively now it's two weeks you have ultra every two weeks so it's like it changed over the years it's like yeah, and it's gonna get bigger and bigger every year Miami Music Week has evolved from what was once known as the Winter Music Conference, where it was more of a business-based event for music industry people, to it now being the global centrepiece for electronic music. Cedric reminisces as he passes some old haunts on Washington Avenue. That used to be an insane club in Miami. It used to be called Chaos. When was that? It was then in 98? called Chaos, sickest club in Miami. It was this, it was two clubs competing. It was Chaos Miami and Living Room, which is down the block right there. So that block right here between seven and 10, Washington was like the hottest block in Miami. There was nothing else around. It's like you wouldn't go out, you have to go to the Living Room, Chaos. It was the sickest thing ever. As we continue down Washington Avenue, Cedric passes his gym, which was the training gym of boxing legend, Muhammad Ali. Right there, it's called, uh, Five Street Gym, that's where Mohamed Ali used to train. 
and Angelo Dundee is trainer, that's his gym. And he reopened, back in the days it was an old building, and uh, they, they built a brand new thing and they decided to reopen the gym. So Angelo Dundee opened this gym, named it the same way, and then he just passed away two months ago. But it's still his gym, they still run it with his partner and everything, so that's why I train every day. This is a proper boxing gym with a full size ring, punch bags, floor to ceiling ball, all the gear, and of course, plenty of homage to the sporting hero. Next stop, and we head to Club Story. Formerly known as Amnesia and Opium Gardens, it's where Cedric hosts his infamous party, The Shit Show. We're here at Story, which is the new addition to Live, to the family of Live, uh, which uh, you're uh, familiar with. They just uh, purchased this club about six months ago, and uh, now it's the hottest club in Miami. I just did my party last night here, uh, the opening of Miami Music Week with my party called The Shit Show, which is my monthly residency in Miami, and it was totally insane. We had sold out the club, a lot of women in there, and the energy was insane. So there you have it. Somewhere to eat, somewhere to keep fit, and somewhere to party. If you ever fancy living in Miami, we take a look at Cedric's luxury penthouse apartment to give you a taste, and the studio where he makes his music. Uh, this is my studio. This is where I did uh, Flip for Tourum record. And uh, I do most of the production here in my house, and then uh, I take that to a bigger studio, like uh, a room better treated than my room to mix this, because it's really hard to mix in this room, but uh, it's really comfortable being in my house to produce here. So. so actually, this is my place and my balcony, and as you can see, this is ultra behind me. So basically, for the next three days, the next week, I'm not gonna be sleeping that much. <laughs> They're gonna be bothering me, but it's fine. Living in Miami and seeing this festival grow so big uh, every single year, you know, I, I was there the first time they did it on the beach, Miami Beach, and then moved it to downtown, and uh, went from like 3,000 people to now 150,000 people festival. It's just an amazing thing, and being, you know, being a local and being, you know, proud of this city, and and actually performing main stage, it's a big deal for me, and you know, so I'm looking forward to next Saturday. We leave Cedric's penthouse apartment and head down Biscayne Boulevard a few blocks away to the massive Ultra Music Festival at Bayfront Park. Ultra is now in its 15th year and for the first time is taking place over two weekends. There will be up to 330,000 fans attending over the course of the two weekends, to check out acts such as David Guetta, Fatboy Slim, Carl Cox, Nicole Mudebear, Eric Prids, Swedish House Mafia, Rusko, Totally Enormous Extinct Dinosaurs, Ida Engberg, Mark Knight, and many more. The lineup really caters for all flavours of electronic music, from EDM to the deepest underground players. Tourum were there for both weekends with their own stage plugged in live to UMF Radio. Joining Tourum were Funk Agenda, Tristan Jabalos, Proc and Fitch, Perupa, Mihalis Safras, Funk Investigation, Jack Savage from Friendly Fires, Butch, Sander Kleinenberg, The Tourum Residents and of course Mark Knight. We caught up with Mihalis, Butch and Funk Agenda. Obviously the, the landscape now is very different to how it was you know like what we're looking at now is is it's it's more of a, a it's it's more of a market now rather than a, than an occupation you know it's not like before when people used to go clubbing it was to as a, a form of release you know like that, that that was that was their that was their reward at the end of the weekend for at the end of the week to because they've worked all week and stuff whereas like now dance music here is a business and and it's an and it's an incredibly fast growing business as well you know like there are the, you know people have realized the value of, of festivals like that like dance music festivals such as as this one people are beginning to realize that you know it's not something that is just for like you know uh, nerds and drug addicts and all this kind of stuff it's a real it's real music and there are real people behind it and there are personalities behind it and you know that 
has become, it, it, it's, it's basic, I mean like I guess one way of putting it is it's kind of like basically the new hip hop over here. You know, hip hop was like, was a, an, an underground form of music that gradually got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it basically dominated the charts. And you've only got to look at where we are now and see who's getting into the top 40 to realize that, you know, a lot of those artists, those hip hop artists, are looking to the EDM artists for inspiration. It's, uh, it's incredible how it's grown. I mean, I, I feel like it doesn't really bear any re relevance to the original scene out here, but, you know, you can't always look back. You can't look back at into it in time and go, you know, oh, if only it was still like that, because it, that's kind of selfish. You, you've got to think about all the new people who've discovered the music and what it means to them. You can't take that away from them. Like, you know, this is, it's, it, it's just as important now to people who are discovering it by turning on the radio and listening to the Top 40 as it was for people going into Studio 54 and hearing the first South Soul records to have an 808 drum machine on them. This was the first time I played at Ultra Festival and it's a new experience. It reminds me uh, back in the days in Germany to the Love Parade. Crazy people, dancing, music, open-minded to everything. About USA, what I think, um, yeah, you have some great guys like Robert Hood or Jeff Mills or whatever, but uh, Frankie Knuckles. But the kids don't know and they just starting to get in touch with it. And the, the new electronic music from USA sounds like almost, it's, I think it's exactly the same what we had in Europe in the 90s. But right now it's with uh, American rap vocals on it. And this sounds for me kind of strange because when I was young I was listening to American music, like, like some rap guys, and now they're doing the garbage <laughs> what we did 10 years ago. And I, uh, when I was young I, I hate the European dance music. My uh, first time that I play at uh, the Ultra Festival for uh, the Tool Room Nights and it was really a great experience, you know, uh, met some of uh, good friends and uh, I would uh, love to come and uh, play again for Tool Room Nights. Actually, uh, you know, uh, when you are in the conference in uh, Miami, uh, the first thing is uh, you come mainly for promoting your own music and uh, also for meeting, you know, your partners, uh, to see the person behind the picture. The time is really limited with all meetings and gigs and whatever, but uh, you know, this is Miami. Now we hit the court for the Red Blue Classic charity basketball match between some of dance music's top underground artists. It's presented by New York-based artist Manic and Visa V Consulting. It will be an annual event and this year's foundation is Big Hearts for Big Dogs, Rescue and Advocacy. It turned out to be a pretty exciting game and this is how it went down. The red team were the fans' favourites as the whistle blew. Seth Troxler was the red team coach and Matt Brookman of Oven Recordings was the blue team coach. The Reds soared into the lead with Chris Martinez, Blondish and MK taking control of the baskets. The blue team scored with some penalty points but failed to sink baskets too, leaving them trailing with the Reds 5-14 ahead. The Reds then extended their lead to 12-24 in the third quarter. In the fourth quarter the Blues closed the gap to 25-28, leaving Red coach Troxler feeling the pressure as the clock ticked down. With only 30 seconds left, the game was amazingly tied at 30-30, which had the crowd on their feet. The game went into overtime and the Reds took the early lead. They extended their lead by four points before the Blues pulled it back to 32-34. The Blues then amazingly took the lead for the first time in the match with a great three-pointer which piles the stress on Seth. It's 35-34 with less than 90 seconds to play before Chris Martinez scores a great two-pointer to bring it 35-36 with the Reds holding on to win the game. Ryan, Ryan, the crossover crossing has no more crossover because I'm champ, <laughs> all right? He tried to single me out on this video, said, Chris, watch your back, but I'm champ, all right? I'm champ. I knew we were going to win. I knew yesterday. Yeah. It was very good, very good. So much fun. I didn't. We had it, and then like, because I wasn't in the game the last like two minutes, I started scoring. You know, we had a, we had a great time out there. Our, our teams both played very valiantly. Yeah, it was a great game, a great comeback. I think it was fun for everyone for a great cause. It was fun. It was, you know, I think it's cool. It was for a good cause, and it's like it's good to play with your friends and 
I was, you know, I was happy so many people came out for the first year. I hope, you know, I hope we can do it again next year and make it even bigger. Okay, it was amazing, man. But I can't hit free throws with a shit, but I can rebound. I can rebound. But yeah, it was good, man. Playing with my boys. And even if we didn't win, we were here just to have fun, charity. You know what I mean? It was good. It was good. I learned a lot. And now, we're going to take the party somewhere else. Well, listen, my brother didn't beat me. His team beat me. All right? Let's get that straight. All right? But it's all good. I love all of them. You know, there's always next year. We're going to keep fighting. We're just going to regroup. And hopefully, we come back better next year. But it's all good. We fought 35 36. They didn't win by a lot. So it's all good. But no, it's all good. It hurts. It hurts. I'm hurt. I'm hurt. <laughs> when we were down by 12 going into the third quarter, I was afraid it was going to be, you know, but we got. We got tied at the end of the fourth quarter, which is what's important. I had no idea it was going to go to overtime. Um, everybody is absolutely beaten and, you know, just super tired. But uh, I'm so happy. It was, you know, it was a success. Everybody had a great time. And we're definitely going to do this next year for sure. It's not just huge festivals and basketball matches during Miami Music Week. There are lots of clubs and parties in action all over. Here are some choice venues and parties that went off during the week. Treehouse is one of the top underground venues in South Beach. It's where the Winter Music Conference parties began over 20 years ago, and it now hosts parties such as Drum Code, Magda's Items and Things, and Cocoon to name a few. The Shelburne is a great pool party, with legendary house labels like Subliminal hosting events, as well as harder parties such as Waveform with Danny Tanaglia. At Story, you can check out trance DJs such as Gareth Emery, and just across the block is the infamous Nikki Beach, with cool parties such as Solomon's dynamic label rocking the swanky room upstairs. The Surf Coma is a Miami institution pool party, with Pete Tong hosting regular shindigs. And of course, no trip to Miami is complete without a visit to space, where you can check artists like Freddie Legrand and Mark Knight smashing out 10-hour sets till the afternoon daylight. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's Cameo, Mint Lounge, and so many other clubs to check out. Miami is undisputedly the party capital of the USA. We're back in Berlin once again and talk with one half of Pampot, Tassilo Ippenberger. Tassilo fills us in on what it's like being part of the German techno outfit. Hello, my name is Tassilo. I'm one part of Pampot, the other part Thomas. My dear partner is on Hawaii right now. He's getting like some proper suntan, you know. <laughs> I'm staying here and work in my new studio space and um, yeah, getting more and more white. So yeah, that's my situation right now. <laughs> well, Thomas and me first connected um, around about actually more than 10 years ago now, because this year we have 10 years of Pampot. And we first met here in Berlin at the audio engineering school, SAE. And uh, we both were, we did this EMP, it's like an electronic music production course. He also really introduced me to the kind of sound we're doing right now, you know, like, or like we, as we did in the beginning, like all this minimal stuff. So he was really into that and brought me into that. I came more from the DJ Hell, international DJ Gigolo music, I would say. Well, I mean, like connection with Mobley. Um, our connection with Mobley started also around about, uh, let me guess, like seven years ago now, or actually also like almost ten years ago now, when we first met uh, Anya and Ralph, Anya Schneider and Ralph Kommen. Because we, Thomas and me, we um, we started doing our first parties, our own first parties in Berlin, just to make sure that we we're gonna have some gigs, you know, because we were like, nobody knew us, so nobody had was interested in booking us, let's say. And that was the reason we decided to do our own parties, which kind of failed, <laughs> hard time, you know. And um, for one of these parties, we invited Anya to play. And the good thing about the fact that nobody came as a guest, you know, like we had like 10 people paying entrance fee and, and we're dancing on the dance floor. The good thing about this was that we have had a lot of time for talking, you know, and we, we told her, okay, we're just working a lot of music. And um, she told us, or they told us, that, they are, that they're gonna um, start a new label, Mobile Records. And uh, so we just, you know, we had, we said, okay, as soon as our tracks are finished, we're gonna send them, uh, send it to Anya and Ralph. And um, two months later, we had our first release on Mobile Records. 
And since then, we are constantly doing our releases on mobile. We had some, some releases on other labels, but mainly all of our stuff is, is on mobile. And this for, yeah, almost 10 years now. No. Well, I would say it's always hard work, and it has to be hard work. You know, you shouldn't, you should never be too satisfied with the, with the. For sure, I'm happy when I have a great party. You know, but still, it is. We are investing money in our promotion. We are like spending a lot of time in the studio, and also like the whole traveling part is is part of the whole work. I would say, you know, and um, more or less, I can talk about us, but it's a 24/7 job, more or less. You know, and. It's hard work, but I like this hard work, you know, it's fun work still, you know, and uh, even if it's stressy, this is fun stress, you know, so I'm enjoying it. Now Fritz Korkbrenner of Soil Records tells all about writing his second artist album, Sick Traveling. Yeah, I mean, like the, the first album, uh, Here Today, Gone Tomorrow, was released in October 10th, which was quite a success here in Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Some in France, I don't know, it was over in the UK. Maybe three or four guys bought that record. Um, and yeah, and I started in February 11 to, to work on ideas for the new album. And from the beginning on, because some people tell him the second album is the hardest, because for the first album, you got the half of your lifetime, for the second, you got a year. Ooh. And, uh, but it wasn't that kind of hard a challenge for me because I knew from the beginning on how I wanted to have that album because I wanted to feature more real life instruments speaking of Fender Costa guitar, Stratocaster guitar, stage rose piano, upright bass, like real like funk and soul music influenced instruments and wanted to put it in that and started like real recording jam sessions with studio musicians and yeah and I wanted to implement that because all of my musical influences and it wouldn't be it wouldn't be real if I would do like a real a real funk or soul album. Speaking of like 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 a Motown copy. It wouldn't be really real. It wouldn't be really that what I do. But it is influenced me a lot, so there is on the one hand the thing that comes into your mind and your heart and that what goes out. So it works as a translator. And I think in that way I wanted to implement these real live instruments and the lyrics that I wrote into, yeah, let's say a dance concept. I don't know how I accomplished that, but the album is done. I can't change that anymore. <laughs> the, the, actual, the, the actual tour for the album is pretty huge. It's the next big step for me, because it's going to be all over Europe, like real concert shows, which starts at <laughs> 8 o'clock and ends at 12, because, because they're real concert venues. You cannot use them like as a club. The owners say, no, it needs to be a real concert. and and I don't know how it is in UK or, but in France, Germany, the people accept it in a way that is kind of a concert. So, and we're traveling with, with a real whole, large travel party of 12 people and a coach. And we have like our own uh, stage setup, which is built for visuals and stuff. And yes, uh, I, I sing live during these performances, which was quite a hustle to organize that in the beginning because as performing as a live act, you always need to use your both hands on the podies and, and faders so you do not have the hand, uh, might be have a third hand, uh, uh, to hold the microphone. So I have a, a microphone attached to, to the cheek and with Indian monitor. We have, we played shows in France uh, last week and the week before and I can proudly say it works. So <laughs> this is what comes to your tongue. Now we check out a dining experience with a difference. Pretadina was born in Berlin and expanded to cover the globe. It started as an idea from founders KP Koffler and Olivia Steele and blends Michelin-starred food, exquisite cocktails, art and music to create a sensory experience for connoisseurs of culture worldwide. It travels to various major cities of the world. Check out their website for more details. We talk to some of the people who bring the Pretadina experience to you and get their view on this very special event. What we do is uh, com combine food, art, um, fashion and uh, create like a, an experience. So, I mean, this is a tense project we did and uh, we go on a world tour now um, following art and uh, fashion and uh, film. And um, it's related in the way we go to places where you normally can't eat and drink um, and then combine food, 
music, entertainment and art in a way that we create a certain momentum for the guests and to, to create a special experience. Well, for me, Pretadine is about it's more than a restaurant. It's about stimulation for all the senses, which is why we love playing here. It's not just about the food, it's about the environment and about enjoying art. And we're very, very lucky to be able to put music, a musical story to what they're trying to do here, which is uh, art in a very, very special and unique place. So why hiring the DJs like Mixology at the moment from London, or we had several DJs also from uh, Berlin. We had people like Tief Schwarz uh, playing in, in certain Petrinés. Is um, to to create this this um, the, a kind of a bridge yeah, between um, quality on on both sides. If you haven't been to Petrinés, I would recommend it because it is an energy like no other. It's not uh, energy there with an upmarket restaurant or because it's got good art, good food or good music. It's the combination of all the senses in the level of positivity that really, really out brings out a lot of yeah, a unique experience in a way. Another full-on episode of Tourum TV done and dusted. Keep a lookout for episode 8 of Tourum TV when we're back in the summer European party capital, Ibiza. <laughs> <laughs>